it's a um, it's a great um, a great honor and privilege to have been invited to be here, uh, both in the UK, but then very specifically also here uh, at this uh, at this college. Um, just a few conversations, and it turns out we know all kinds of people in common, including, uh, I'm sorry, I've already forgotten your first name. Jordan. Jordan, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, turns out Jordan spent an hour in my classroom in Waterloo, which I wasn't alert enough to have noticed at the time. <laughs> um, uh, I like the way sometimes miscommunication works. Um, so the title that you've given me uh, is a little different than the one that I'm working with. Fine. But uh, I, when I started off by saying I like the way miscommunication happens, it's a very fitting title you've given, Seek Peace and Pursue It. Because what I have called my talk is Patient Pursuit. Uh, peacemaking and the Patience of God so both the term pursuit and the term patience are very much part of it. I want to tell you one other uh, anecdote that came with miscommunication. In this case, I was talking about this interesting mix of patience and pursuit to a group of Lutheran pastors in the Canadian Rockies one time. And this, the particular session, it was a multi-session event, this particular session um, had to do with patience as a mode, a mode of peacemaking, and uh, it was preceded by some worship. And we were to sing the song, and I don't remember the song now, something about um, uh, the, the peace of the Lord be with you. Maybe there's a song that has that phrase in it, in your experience. Well, they had, they had a typo, which I'm convinced occasionally typos are inspired by the Holy Spirit, because they left out an E. And so it became the pace of the Lord, which struck me as absolutely being perfect for a focus on the patience of God. And so at the end, after my presentation, we were all wishing each other the pace of the Lord. Um, so, so think about patience and pursuit together as part of, um, as, as two constituent and necessary elements to what I'm talking about. Rebecca and I are here as uh, guests of the Anabaptist Network in the UK. Um, uh, we're also Mennonites, and Mennonites have nothing to do with men, uh, uh, any more than they have to do with women. Uh, Mennonites take their name from one of the early Anabaptist leaders who was from the Netherlands. His name was Menno Simons. And so just like Lutherans can be called Lutherans, we're called Mennonites. Um, that, that, and it's one of the oldest, and I suppose we could say one of the largest Anabaptist denominations uh, 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 around today. So that's where we come from. I wanted to say that uh, for a couple of reasons that actually pertain to this topic. The Anabaptists shared with the rest of the Reformation um, a, a very strong sense of the importance of the Bible. Uh, the, the, the term sola scriptura, you know, the, the Bible only, was something that took root in this particular wing of uh, the, the Reformation history in a way that probably most of the reformers neither anticipated nor particularly welcomed. Um, but Taking the Bible really seriously provided a kind of, you might almost say a kind of revolutionary impulse um, that was focused particularly on taking seriously um, the teachings of Jesus. So um, there were a couple of really strong marks of the Anabaptist movement. The term Anabaptist, of course, means literally rebaptizing. And so for the Anabaptists, uh, I should say that was a kind of nickname given to these folks who felt it was really important to be baptized at the point at which you were able to commit yourself to actually following Jesus. That's something that's taken for granted. We usually divide it between the, 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 the various denominations, and, and many of them we don't really particularly fight with each other over that. In the 16th century, that was breaking apart the church. 
because the population of the state, of the citizenry, and the population of the church were coextensive. So to say the real church is made up of those who have been baptized and committed themselves in life to actually follow Jesus, the German word they used was Nachfolge, was a really radical thing. And there were a couple of other treasonous moves they made. They read Jesus' words about not swearing and took it, quote, literally. Jesus says your yes should be enough. You're always telling the truth, which you should do. Your, nes should, your yes should be enough, and your no should be enough. So they refused to swear, which was treasonous. And then they read uh, Jesus' words about, you've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, um, do not resist the one who does evil, or do not resist evil. There are different ways we can translate. We might want to actually talk about that a little later on. But that's where the term non-resistance comes from. And, and that has to do with turning the cheek, uh, giving the last bit of clothing that's, uh, that you have, uh, walking the second mile, those very, very famous, what we might call little mini parables that Jesus has about non-retaliation. The Anabaptists said, Jesus is really clear on this. In fact, they became very suspicious of hermeneutical devices that would let you slip out from underneath uh, the, uh, the teachings of Jesus that seemed to be really pretty clear. Um, that, only accused, that only brought accusations of uppityness. <coughs> Who are you? You're not nearly as educated as I, as I am. Why are you telling me what the Bible says? So it was a very fractious relationship. And Anabaptists uh, had a very, very um, um, rough uh, reputation about this, saying no to the oath, saying no to the sword, insisting on the church being the community of committed believers who had pledged themselves to following Jesus. Those were, those were breaking up uh, what was by then a 1,200-year-old system. So that's a, that's a long, long-term system. It produced a lot of opposition, a great deal of opposition, and a lot of persecution. And one of the consequences was that Mennonites, uh, when they couldn't take the persecution anymore, would seek safe haven somewhere. And then when they, that wasn't safe anymore, would move again. And so migration and insularity became part of the story. Um, interestingly, the, the, the Mennonites didn't use language like non-resistance. Their term, here we should translate much more carefully, their term was the German word Wehrlosigkeit, which means defenselessness. So not defending oneself. A, a, a really good way of translating this would be deliberate vulnerability. Deliberate vulnerability. I don't know whether that rings a bell, but it's a little bit different from non-resistance. It means it doesn't speak so much about what you don't do as it has to do with the stance you take in the world. It thus opened itself to suffering as the mode of faithfulness to Jesus. If Jesus suffered, how should his followers expect not to? Okay? So they weren't pacifists in the way we often think today. They were people who felt that the way of Jesus meant to refuse to defend oneself in face of opposition, to literally take up the cross as Christ took up the cross. When that gets mixed up with insularity, it also can easily produce a situation in which you move, sort of, in a sense, move out of the world. So we have co-religionists today who refuse to drive cars and have landlines, uh, cell phones for some reason have bypassed this prohibition, but they will, <laughs> they will use horse and buggy instead of cars. Uh, they will refuse, in many cases, to use uh, power-driven farm implements and plow the fields with horses and plows and so on, uh, etc. Non-conformity to the world. Okay? Those are cherished things within the Mennonite community, regardless of how they line up on these questions of technology, but there are people who have taken that very, very radically. And that produces communities that are very 
closed. So the stance of nonviolence wasn't like the pacifism we typically talk about today, which is a kind of social, socio-political analysis of what makes most sense in a world of violence. Or it might describe a way in which you're engaged with this. It, it had to do with the vulnerability that you take on as the body of Christ in an evil, violent world, and you don't hit back. At best, you go away when it gets too messy. Now, something happened that I take to be a remarkable gift of God. The gospel didn't quite get turned off with all this insularity. So that at the beginning of the 20th century, the missionary movement that exploded also exploded for Mennonites. So that if I can move 100 years, or more than that now, uh, later, we are now a global community, I'm speaking now as Mennonites, a global community in which the majority of persons are non-Caucasian and live in the global south. So some of the biggest Mennonite churches are today in Ethiopia, Congo, India, Indonesia, etc. Okay? That's important because it meant the church moved out of its insularity into the world. And that has also had an effect on how we've thought about peacemaking and how we've heard the words of Jesus. It moved from offering relief, first of all, to co-religionists during times of famine and revolution, to why don't we help everybody where we can, to if we're going to be involved with, with things like uh, relief work, um, shouldn't we be asking why there is so much problem? Is there, are there not justice questions? So very quickly, the issue shifted to a kind of analyzing the world. It's more than just, we won't hit back to how should we be present in the world. So the missionary movement, and you might say a reframing of the peace question, has, has moved that way out into the larger circle. So today, if you ask Mennonites today about peace, we will talk about pacifism. We're quite happy to call ourselves pacifists. And we'll talk about peacemaking, not non-resistance. Most of my students, including the Mennonite ones, have no idea what sense to make of non-resistance. <coughs> that doesn't ring true. If you're going to be in the world, you ought to resist something. And if you're going to be in the world, you ought to make peace. And then we read the Sermon on the Mount again, and it says, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who love their enemies. And love is more than just suffering each other, as much as it includes that. It means actually engaging with this world. So, I mean, this is not to toot our own horn. I'm just charting a major change in the frame of reference. Mennonites today are on, this, on the forefront, for instance, around issues such as restorative justice, uh, which has made its way into the court system uh, again and again. So you have a situation in which the ethos has shifted from a kind of, you might say, defensive defenselessness to an activist peacemaking mode. Let me say that I think that this is completely uh, appropriate and consistent uh, with, um, with uh, the New Testament. There were texts we didn't read very much, including the one that Jeremy mentioned before, or from uh, Psalm 34, uh, seek peace and pursue it. Turns out that gets quoted a number of times in the New Testament um, as a way of capturing the stance followers of Jesus take in the world. Now the term pursuit, there are a number of you who have already indicated to me that you work well in Greek. Uh, the, the term pursuit is a very interesting one. It's the very same word that is used that gets translated as persecuted. Now, persecution is a really strong term. There's, a, by the way, a wonderful play of words in Romans 12, where in verse 13, uh, Paul makes a comment about hospitality, which usually gets translated something like this, practice hospitality. You might almost think, make sure you have somebody over for tea on Sunday afternoon. And then the very next verse is, bless your persecutors, or bless those who persecute you. 
Do you know that it's exactly the same verb? Practice hospitality should be translated chase, pursue the stranger with love. That's translated very literally. And then bless those who are pursuing you. It's a kind of persecution versus persecution. Only in this case, the persecution of the stranger with love. I know that that doesn't sound uh, very persuasive. But it speaks to a, a, an enormously aggressive understanding of peacemaking. It's not just making peace, it is actually chasing after peace. A relentless, dogged pursuit, you might say, that is very much part of the uh, ethos of peacemaking in the New Testament. Peace is not simply something you patiently wait for. Uh, it is not something you carefully and coolly make. It is something that the followers of Jesus pursue, um, chase after, you might almost say persecute, the way, if I can put it this way, the way predators pursue their prey. I'm using that with a deliberate irony here, but the New Testament plays with irony a good deal. Um, the, uh, 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 I have a book back here called Jesus and the Subversion of Violence. And the title that I had chosen, this was what SBCK chose, but the title I had chosen, and the American publisher thankfully accepted, was Killing Enmity, which is the British translation of Ephesians 2, uh, where Christ kills or murders hostility through his own death. You can't find a more aggressive way of thinking about the cross as a weapon, albeit so filled with irony because what is killed is interestingly hostility itself. It's a little bit like in chapter 4 of Ephesians where Christ takes captivity captive. Um, on Wednesday night I'm participating in a debate and the title they've given it is Who Would Jesus Shoot? Um, and, uh, of course, most everybody tells me he'd shoot himself, or he wouldn't, or whatever it is. The interesting thing is, in the New Testament, we might almost say he'd shoot enmity. He'd shoot hostility. He'd, shoot, he'd find some way of murdering the thing that destroys human life, which is a very aggressive term. And that helps us also, to, for instance, to understand why in the New Testament you have military imagery so non-retaliation becomes a form of hatred. And that's a form of, you might say, spiritual quality. What I see in Jesus, both in the way he lived and in the way in which he taught us to live, is a kind of patient <coughs> keeping the door open for reconciliation, making sure the door is not closed uh, for repentance. And the term, I want to, repentance is such an inadequate word to capture the Hebrew teshuvah or shuv, which means to turn, a kind of literally a turning in the relationship, or the Greek metanoia, you know, a kind of literally change of thinking, kind of coming second thoughts, a, a new perspective that you, that you bring to bear on the situation. And, and this patience goes all the way back to the way God is depicted in the Old Testament. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, you may remember that, um, uh, that Exodus uh, 34 talks about God who visits the sins of the fathers on the third and the fourth generation, but goes on to say that God is forgiving and steadfast to a thousand generations. Uh, Psalm, I'm just giving you a few examples. Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a merciful God and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, th th that's a theme that gets expressed repeatedly. It was a way of trying to explain 
how it could possibly be that God puts up with so much of a mess in this world. Is God absent? Are we wrong that there is a God? Or might it just be that God is keeping the door open for us to repent? There is a wonderful uh, uh, text that I'm not going to spend much time on. I wish it were in the Protestant canon too. It's sadly only in the Catholic one. But in the wisdom of Solomon, let me read just a few lines from this. Uh, this is from chapter 11. Before you, the whole world is like a speck that tips the scales, like a drop of morning dew that falls on the ground. But you are merciful to all, for you can do everything. In other words, mercy as the exercise of divine power. And you overlook people's sins so that they might repent. In other words, this is not the absence of God. This is God's patience that is tethered to the expectation and the hope that people will turn or return, you might say. I love this phrase here. For you love everything that exists and detest, detest nothing of the things you've made. For you wouldn't have made anything if you had hated it. You spare all things, for they are yours, O Lord, you who love the living. I wish that were on plaque. That is just an absolutely spectacular way of capturing the patience and love of God for an errant uh, a creation. Um, this comes to expression in the New Testament. Let me show you, let me read just a few things here. Um, in, in Romans 2 verse 4, Paul speaks of the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience. And then says this, don't you realize that God's kindness, we might say patience, is meant to lead you to repentance. What if we thought of the church's peacemaking stance as a fundamentally evangelistic one, holding open the door to transformation? I think if I'm the little bit I know about the Oasis community, social transformation is very much part of the vocabulary we use. Be interesting to tether patience to social transformation and ask what that might mean strategically. Um, there are many ways this comes to expression. I remember 2 Peter uh, 2, uh, 2 Peter 3, I should say, a text you know, that has with God one day is a thousand years. In my tradition, that was usually only invoked at times when we had arguments with each other over the return of Christ. When is that going to happen? How long is a God day? Right? Not like a dog year, but a God day. Uh, well, a thousand years. So where are we at on the timeline? But what we didn't notice is verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you. You see that word patience again? Not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. There is again, patience and repentance. It's a deliberate keeping the door open. Patience is not giving impunity. Patience is not saying, it's okay, whatever. Patience is always tied to the expectation or the hope for transformation, for return, for reconciliation. Nowhere does this come to more powerful expression than in Matthew 5. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy so that you might be sons, and we should add daughters, of your Father in heaven, who lets the sun shine, or literally shines the sun on the just and the unjust, importantly, and pours rain on the just and the unjust. That is divine perfection. And in this case, it means literally every new day the sun goes up. Every day the rain falls, and you are blessed in this country by having both experiences, usually, uh, several times in one day. Um, uh, every time, it's a way of seeing nature and its constancy as divine patience offered in the expectation of repentance, of turning, of transformation, etc. 
Now, to me, this is an extremely important dimension of how we understand the biblical uh, 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 image of patience. Because it means, as the Beatitudes say, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the sons and daughters of God. Or, if you want to be sons and daughters of God, you should love your enemies as God does. That means that to be a son or a daughter of God, to be part of the family of God, to be part of the church, is to be drawn in and implicated into the divine exercise of patience, which to me is a, a much more elastic way of framing the question of peacemaking than to simply immediately talk about what strategies work. Because when you're talking that way, you're always, at, you're always being forced to answer the question, if I don't do this, or if I do this, what will be the outcome? What should we do about? Those are very legitimate questions. But they need to be framed by a larger understanding of the church's participation in the project of divine patience. Um, we don't kill because we don't want to bring closure. I'll give you a silly example. There was recently a situation in Texas where they have the death penalty. And it is vociferously supported by much of the church, especially the Bible-believing church, which is really ironic, given what I'm trying to tell you, I read in the Bible. And then one of the problems was that one of the women on death row became a Christian. And so Christians demonstrated, saying she should not be put to death. She's a Christian. And I keep thinking, you missed something here. It should be the opposite. It should be, okay, she's a Christian. Let her go. It's the ones who aren't that we ought to be patient with in this case, making sure the door stays open for the reconciliation with God and with those they've harmed. And there was an example. My wife and I uh, were watching CNN. Shortly after 9-11, some of you may remember, there was the gun, the gunman who, the, 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 uh, Mal, what's his name, Richard Malvo and somebody else who were snipers. They were killing people off. And we heard on CNN, uh, one of the reporters uh, interviewing a man whose wife had been killed by. And they had finally found out who had done this. And his argument, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here because it was a very moving thing when we contacted the person. He said, uh, well, in, in, to CNN, he said, my problem is I don't think they should receive the death penalty. Why? Well, I'm a Christian. And Jesus says, if you don't forgive, how can you expect to be forgiven? So I hope they go to jail because they did something terrible by killing my wife. But I don't want them to get the death penalty. I hope rather they, in jail, they find a chaplain and that they come to know Jesus and then they can make their peace with God. But my goodness. So we phoned this person, got him on the line, and we found out he's a member of a Pentecostal church and he had read the Bible way too literally. It was a kind of simple way of saying Jesus says, and then we should, and God is patient because God wants people to repent. So since we're sons and daughters of God, we should do the same. What if we thought that way also in terms of our role in society? Now, I want to conclude uh, so that we have time for discussion by coming back to the issue of pursuit. How do we at the same time pursue peace when we're patient? This is a really interesting question. Well, you know, I think if you had asked someone like Martin Luther King, are you patient? He would have said, no. But then if you had looked at the patience with which he kept at it, kept at it, kept at it, you would have said, hmm, I think you are, Martin. Um, secondly, if you had noticed that he wanted very much for people not to hate the police who were attacking their demonstrations. But to pray for them, we would have noticed something else. That's patience at work. There is no necessary contradiction between the kind of patient pursuit 
of the stranger with love or the enemy with love, the kind of persistent shining the sun and pouring the rain on the just and the unjust. There's no contradiction between that and pursuit. Um, I thought of an example. I don't know how many of you have cats. Uh, we don't, and I'm grateful, but <laughs> I, I don't want to offend anybody who's a cat lover. But I've watched cats on our back lawn. When the cat is moving very slowly and deliberately, what's going on? Pardon? Hunting. Hunting, and typically speaking, you're just checking the lawn to see where is there some poor mouse that's about to, or a squirrel or whatever is that's going to lose their life, or a bird, right? In other words, the notion, but, but the cat is moving so slowly so as to be able to seize the moment when it's there. That was a kind of interesting way of helping me to understand how it can possibly be that we have in the Bible images of God as an impatient warrior, <coughs> and at the same time images of God, of a God who is so patient that the biggest scandal in the Bible is not what God does, but what God doesn't do. How many Psalms are all about Arise, God, or when are you going to do something? Even in the book of Revelation, in chapter 6, the souls under the altar, the martyrs, how long, O Lord, until you finally address this situation? The scandal in the Bible is God's maddening and scandalous patience. Think about this. The death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ we celebrate as salvation. That was one of the riskiest, most patient, most almost irresponsible patience on the part of God to offer salvation in that life. Think of what's happened since in 2,000 years. So we are drawn as a community of followers of Jesus into that form of patience, the, the patience of a hunter. That is to say, people who are out of love for the enemy, out of a desire for repentance, seek ways of making sure the future doesn't get closed on that opportunity, but at the same time are willing to seize any and every opportunity to make peace, to bring reconciliation, even if that means to offer our own lives. And that's what Jesus means, means about taking up the cross. So I'm going to stop there. That's about 40 minutes. And... Um, and uh, we have lots of time now. Maybe there are things that I can expand on or examples. Yes? 